What's happening, everybody? Welcome and welcome back to the drum. The drum Sorry. Connection. Wow, we're so excited. We can't wait to, to talk to you guys today. Um, I'm here with my three very good friends, amazing drummers, terrific educators, Rick Stojak in San Diego, Bart, Bart Roby in Southern California, and Chip Ritter in Tucson, Arizona, spinning his way all the way from Tucson. Uh, and hi, I'm here in uh, the Bay Area in Northern California, and we are here every week, every Tuesday at 11 a.m. to bring to you discussions about drumming, about teaching, about music, about life, but mostly about drumming. Yeah. And um, we are today going to talk about, uh, oh, before we get to what we're going to talk about today, want to mention that we have a Patreon page, uh, and if you support what we do, if you come here and you like what we do and you appreciate what we offer, uh, please support us by checking out our Patreon page. There's great stuff you can get books from each of us. There's videos and stuff. Um, and all you, you know, we'll take anything a dollar, five dollars, you know, advice, uh, anything <laughs> you want to offer on our Sorry. Patreon page. Yeah. We're, we're, Give we're us free, Give us free drum, free drum lessons. Um, and what else? Oh, we'd also like to thank Aquarian drum heads uh, for their support. We're all for Aquarian artists, and Aquarian really takes care of us in every single way. That they possibly can so we're, we're grateful to them and next week we've got a super duper special episode coming up next week i'll tease it now and then we'll, we'll talk about it again at the end of the show today um we're going to be doing a broadcast uh featuring chris brady and mike brooker the two aquarian uh dudes uh who will be uh talking about aquarian drum heads what makes the drum heads how they make them what makes them different, what kind of drum heads you need for what kind of styles you want to play, how they differ in sound and tone. And uh, that's going to be super informative. And we're going to be giving some heads away as part of that show next week. So be sure to tune in next week uh, for a feature on Aquarian drum heads. And in the meantime, we're going to talk today about drumming styles that you need to know. Yeah, now, awesome. That awesome. can mean a lot of different things to different people, right? Yeah, right. Um, and, and rather than just sort of dump a big list on everybody, you know, Rick's list of what you need to know, Bart's list of what you need to know, I thought we could sort of kick it around the one at a time. And Bart and Rick are at drum sets today, so they can they can demonstrate the grooves if, if need be. And I'm, I'm only going to pick the hardest, most esoteric grooves for you guys to play. <laughs> oh, Perfect. no. Perfect. Yeah. Can oh, you play that? Yeah, right. The, uh, the fill sequence in uh, Tom Sawyer and then, you know. Um, so, uh, oh man, my drum just blew up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it just broke. exploded. <laughs> they went, they vanished. <laughs> so, so, you know, we, we've all, we're all professional drummers. We've all been, uh, found ourselves in lots of different kinds of playing situations. Sometimes you're at a jam session. Sometimes you're at a gig. Sometimes you're at a recording session and, uh, or at a rehearsal, even just a rehearsal. And a lot of times someone will say they'll reference a certain kind of style or a groove. Um, and they'll say, Hey, can you play me a groove? That's kind of like, you know, cold sweat, the James Brown cold sweat groove. And it's got that kind of vibe. Or the, when I was writing this tune, I was listening to that tune and thinking about that. So can you give me that kind of groove? Yeah. Or other times they don't say anything at all. And they just ask you to play and you've got to figure out what's the right vibe and the right feel based on what you're hearing. Right. So there's a whole range of things that as a, as a, you know, professional or semi-professional drummer, you have to be adept at, right? You have to have knowledge of a wide range of styles. Everybody agree with that? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. So, um, let's yes. uh, let, let's start with Rick. I'll kick it to you, Rick. I, what? Um, give, give, throw me one, uh, like you know, sort of style that you need to be proficient in as a drummer. Okay. All right. So, I'll start off with something I've really, really used, and that was way back when I was playing with Barnyard Ballers, which is a psychobilly band. The uh, guitarist wrote a song called 15 miles from the border or 15 miles. Cause we're in San Diego. We're 15 miles from the border. Oh, and that's cool. The verse had a very Latin feel Now these guys and not, you know, none of us are big experts on Latin music, but I had enough experience with Latin drumming and studying to get by. And, and so, um, the verse had, had a little groove and I, it was sort of, um, Almost like a rumba. It was kind of like that. And, nice. and so it's sort of like cool. an all-purpose Latin kind of feel. Uh, a little bit rumba-esque. It had that, had, had that kind of vibe on the head. And, um, you know, the, 
the cross stick. Hold on, I have an effect on that. That's a little better. The the cross stick. So this, all of this Latin kind of stuff. It 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 really it really is kind of draw draws its energy and vibe from conga playing and other percussion instruments. So right. if you play a, a classic conga part, a timbao, boom boom, tak, boom boom, the tak, the two, it's like a slap on a conga, and then the boom boom on the conga, boom boom, that's the open tone. So what we're really doing is we're emulating the congas, is what I'm trying to say. Oh, yeah. Yep. And cool. then and then the tune that was just the verse and and the tune totally had like a groove shift, what I would call a groove shift because then it went <laughs> Then it went into like this train part. The guy the, the guitar said picture um picture like those old movies 1800s the black and white where they tie a tie a lady to a train track, right? You know the the evil villain in the 1800s, and the train is crumbing, and the and the and the you know and the girl is saved by the hero. You know it's got that train sound. So I did that on the hi hat, and then it went, and then it went run into a puppy. So that one track had three completely different kinds of feels to it. And the goal was to keep them, keep them flowing. Uh, they did have tempo changes too. The, the the Latin part was slow, the train built up, and then the punk part we purposely went faster. And so this one song would bring tempos. It had three different tempos purposely. Um, when when you did that as a yeah. when, when you were playing when you recorded the song, did you? Yeah. Was were the three different tempos cut to click, or did you just let the song flow? Was it beat mapped? How did you do that, Rick? That that is a that is a great question. Um, I think I started. The, it was a long time ago. The first <clears throat> verse I played with a click, hmm. and then we shut the click off, and then the rest I just winged it. We didn't do any copying and pasting. Cool. Um, at all. That's but all. That's, that's always a thing, yeah. you know. I mean, yeah. when you're uh, you know, you listen to, you know, you listen to a lot of the old classic stuff that I love, you know, and, yeah. and you can tell that uh, songs weren't recorded with a click, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm always curious about that. Sorry. I geeked out. Yeah. There. No, that I is, that is a great question. You. Right. Because, because Bart to elaborate on that, right. We could have recorded this. Right. Recorded a great verse of that. Got the best take of the verse, right? Right. Then record, right. record that yep. one time, put it in three times, and then the last punk thing, record that. Right. And there it is. And space yeah. It yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, man. yeah, yeah. And that's so yeah. common in recording now. That's that's also why you want to be able to play any of this stuff to a click, because you might have to do it that way. Right, right, yep. right. Exactly, exactly. Yep. So being able to work with a click is a is a big one. So yeah. big time, big time. So yeah. the song is fifteen miles. It's up on YouTube by Barnyard Ballers. The lyrics are not for everyone, so I'm going to give you an E for explicit on the lyrics. <laughs> hey, Rick, I want to I want to check in with about something you mentioned earlier. You, you referred to the rumba beat. Um, yeah. Right. That. Yeah. That yeah. Rhythm. And you did it on the hi hat, but what if you, you, you all familiar with the song "Unchain My Heart" by Ray Charles? Or he, he wouldn't, he didn't write it, but the, the original, the uh, the most popular bump. Do, 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 do. Unchain my heart, right? Yeah, I know the song. Uh, yeah, snares got, off on that. Yeah, snares off. He does basically pop rakata, and then the the rest of the eighth notes are on the toms. Pop rakata. Something in that in that in vibe, vein. right, right, right. So that's that's a useful groove that that comes up surprising amount. Um, and th th it's something very similar to that like, that referred. You know, the mambo, mambo is a Latin beat, but there's the uh, the New Orleans mambo is referred to papa da ba 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 without that roll da 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 just on the snare drum. Put it, go ahead and put your snares back on and do that thing, same with that thing. Like a. Snares on. Oh, snares on. No, no toms. 
Oh, Ollie. Like that? Yeah, something like that. That's kind of like a Mardi Gras mambo. Uh, if you're familiar with that New Orleans classic, that's got that. Kind yeah. Of so that that beat yeah. right there that you referenced is actually kind of multi-purpose and can work for lots of different uh, applications. I got. I got to. I got to look that up. Um, while while Bart's going. Here, here's what I want to. I want to. I want to kind of elaborate, uh, if I may, on two things that that Rick touched on, and I'm gonna. I'm gonna geek out just a little bit here, and That's what I'm gonna geek far. out on is is actually a tone thing. Okay, so I'm gonna go to my sky cam here. One of the things when you talked about the side stick, I'm really pretty anal about my side stick sound. And mm -hmm. so you, you're mentioning Latin. So I'm going to, I'm going to a bossa nova, right? So I really kind of think about a bossa nova as here, right? This is the bossa, I think. And I kind of shape it as, uh, 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 uh. and you can kind of shape the groove, I think, with the kick drum. But I think the most important part for me is that side stick. And what yeah. I do is I really, like I'm a Vic Firth guy, and this one's about worn out here, but on the 5A, you might even see where I've, I've drawn a circle around the stick right there with the Sharpie. I'm, I'm really pretty anal about the side stick sound. This snare drum actually yeah. is tuned really tight. <laughs> I was talking to the guys about before the show. This was for a recording session I did last week. So it's tuned pretty tight, but the, the side stick sound is nice on it. I um, My normal go-to snare drums that I tour with and that I play with the band, I use wood hoops because I, I, I think the wood hoops just really make the snare drum pop. Mm. I also, I, you know, I use the silk screens on the stick. Again, this one's pretty much worn off as an older used Vic Firth stick but I found that like in this case right here where it says 5a the size of the stick you know for me that's where it sounds best I also have noticed that different drums I guess you know in quotation marks have their happy place you know so mm -hmm. I'll find that okay I think if I play the snare drum or I play my my side stick um and I, and I, some drums, it might sound like in this case, I'm right over a lug. Some drums, oh, it's got to be in between the lugs, right, to really yeah. sound good. This drum, it kind of sounds good everywhere. This is a, um, what is this? This is a five and a quarter inch Gretsch walnut snare drum. I'm, I really like uh, mostly metal snare drums, Superphonics, Black Beauties. I'm a Gretsch guy, but something special about the Ludwig snares that I just love. The other thing I want to touch base on real quick and geek out on here is um, is this, Rick. And this is I'm really reaching here apples and oranges. But you said uh, something about a, a train, and right. I want to talk about a train beat. Okay, yeah, you did this in your clinic. In. One yeah. of the things that and 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 you probably know a lot more about train beats than I do, Rick. But um, one of the things like when I do play a train beat. Um, or, you know, if, if you're in a country band, a lot of times a train beat will re be referred to as, and I know I'm on the sky cam, you're looking down on me right now, but uh, it's referred to as sometimes the dance that people will do to it, like a 10 step or a two step. Okay. And whenever I play one, I like to use hot rods because th these particular ones, it, it just, I don't know, to me, it just sounds better. It, it sounds uh, better than than sticks for for you know stylistically speaking. So so I'm playing a train. So anyway, for me, that you know, again, just kind of geeking out here and what little bit I know about train beats and what little bit I know about Latin playing a bossa nova. Uh, is uh you know those are the those are kind of the little things that i do and and what i know about about latin music would fit into a thimble but i'm i i say that not to put 
my drumming down or my abilities down. It's just that I don't, I didn't study a lot of Latin music. I know enough that I can get through a gig or recording session. I can teach it to a student who wants to learn and then I'll hand them off to a teacher who might, if they really want to go that way. Uh, one of my old students, Chris Berry, he really wanted to learn about Latin music. So I got him going on some bossa novas and some slower samas and I handed him off. I think he went to Matt Johnston. Uh, but anyway, that's kind of my little geek out thing there on the, on the side stick sound that you had mentioned and uh and for a train beat sound i think those those things are very important stylistically i think the sound and the authenticity does that make sense yes all right okay. can i can i um can i can you put your overhead camera view on for a second I'll ask you a i can yes so uh if you take a look at where bart has his stick relative to the edge to the hoop of the drum um, and you'll see he's got the line on his stick. It's maybe four inches or so mm -hmm. extended past the rim. Yep. Now, Bart, demonstrate what happens if you if you change the position of the stick. So let's say oh, you, perfect. Let's say you slide it back toward you know toward the left, and so you've only got one inch sticking out of the. Now listen to that. It's just dead. dead. Right. Dead. You hear that's really thin and not very woody sounding. Right. And now go right. too far. Go, now go the other direction too far. Kind of ball. Right? It doesn't have that sharp. Uh, piercing click, but now find your sweet spot. Right, yeah. So tone, right? I mean, the tone of your of your stick there. That's that's pretty critical for for making the the grooves pop. And right. of course, you know, people. Uh, I've I've encountered this in lessons where people will say, "Well, how do I get my if I'm moving my left hand around? Because if I'm mm -hmm. playing a mambo or a Latin groove that's not a bossa nova, often the left hand will be moving back and forth between the, the side stick and the tom toms, right? In a right. Afro Cuban twelve eight or a mambo groove, so with a tumbao pattern. So how do you sort of find that spot as you're moving back and forth? Well, Bart had that one great idea, which is the the circle, a, a sharpie on the you know around the stick. Or and that's it. You know what? That's exactly what I do. Great point, Jeremy. I, you know, and before we got on it again, knowing enough to be dangerous, a Latin uh, Afro-Cuban 12A, and I'm just going to play it on my top tom here. But um, what I do is, it honestly, is just that. I. That's why I have that that stripe on there, you know. What I do is here, I don't have a cowbell on the kit right now. Um, so I'm just playing it on the bell of the ride cymbal. But what I'm kind of doing is I'm playing up on the bell, but my, my visual focus is two things. And, and, and I talk to my students about this a lot. I use my peripheral vision, meaning I'm, I'm looking right here. My eye is focused right here. So when I, when I go from I'm not, I don't have to look up here. I'm still looking here so that when I drop the stick, I'm kind of, you know, still trying to land. I guess I would call it within a zone. I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm here. Yeah. Right. So that, yeah. that I don't go like you said, and, plank and, right. and kill it. You know, I yeah. want, I still want that sweet spot. Right. I'm, I'm going back and forth here using my peripheral vision. So like that. That, that's, that's great. Um, one of the, since we're, I, I've got to jump in here, we're talking about Latin beats. Um, I think I've got a little bit more experience than, than you guys with some of that stuff, just because you have to have some of that stuff as a jazz player, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in every jazz gig, there's going to be some Latin tunes. There'll be some bossas. And remember, bossas and sambas are Brazilian, uh, right. whereas for Cubans, kind of a different, a different flavor and a different Completely vibe. Completely different. Yeah. Sometimes right. they do all. You know, people refer to bossa novas kind of loosely under the Latin umbrella. They'll say, "Oh, right. it's a Latin feel," and you know, Latin, Latin by itself doesn't tell you anything. You know, it, well, it tells you something, but it doesn't tell you what exactly to play. Right. Um, you know, if you were playing in a salsa band or playing in, in a Cuban band, they wouldn't call anything you're doing a Latin groove. Like, you know, it's like, well, what is it? Is it a wawanko? Is it a mambo? Is it a merengue? Right. All of them have different names and very specific uh, yeah. styles. Yeah. Uh, different. And, and, it, and who was it? Bart or Rick mentioned that all those Latin grooves actually come from percussion parts. 
right? Right. So like when you're growing up as a, as a percussionist in Cuba, as a drummer, you don't start on the drum set. You start with, you know, paraclaves or a cowbell and you learn all the percussion parts, the congas, the timbales, the bell parts. Mm -hmm. And yes. when you're playing drum set, you understand how your drum kit groove is kind of like an amalgamation of these various percussion parts. Yes. Right. And if you're playing with other percussionists in your band, if you happen to have a conga player, you might, you would change what you're doing potentially because to not double the conga part. And you would know how the conga part is a piece of the drum set groove, right? Right. So really, I mean, to, 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 to study this stuff and really get deep into it, you know, the best way to go is to learn where all the drum set parts come from. Right. You're really just emulating all of those percussion instruments on the drum set is, right. is what we're right. doing. Yeah. Right. And this music existed before there was drum set. Right. So it was all percussion right. battery. Yeah. And you're you're and yeah, like, like, you. when you're covering all those different parts. I mean, you, you I, the reason that I even know like that, uh, that I know that the, the Afro Cuban thing and I and I worked on that or the bossa nova and again you guys know way more than I Jeremy and and Rick than I would know really is to study I when I was you know working on my independence being able to just move my left hand around the kit or like watching Rick flow up underneath his 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 left hand up to the tom tom it's so so amazing and that's why I even studied it you know uh, what little bit I do know it's um but I think that, again, not only having a little bit of knowledge of a bossa nova or an Afro-Cuban 12A can maybe help you on a gig or a recording session, but I think it will help your overall drumming just because yeah. you, you know, and I agree, if I was going to be that person, I would take a deep dive and, and, and just study that stuff. But I think also it's, it can help you any style that you play, having just a little bit of knowledge to move that's around right. the kit a little bit, you know, and it's, it's, that's a great point. And it's not just, it's not just a, a coordination thing. It's also a touch thing. Yes. Right. Yes, exactly. Right. Yes. When you're playing different styles. You have to learn to make the drum set sound different from other styles, right? Everybody, Back to what I was saying about the side stick, the tone, right? Right, right. 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 But, or, but it could also be relative, you know, the balance of the parts of the kit relative to each other, right? Mm, so yeah, when you're yeah. playing jazz, for example, a lot of my my rocks, you know, I start all my students out playing rock, learning rock. It's simple, it's, it's you know, cuts through a lot of different styles and some of them get really good and then they eventually they may want to switch to jazz or maybe they're playing their high, they're more audition for high school jazz band. And they play with a heavy hand and a heavy foot. And that's not, that's, you can't make jazz sound the way jazz is supposed to sound if you play with a touch of a rock drummer. So you've got to learn right. to manipulate the sticks differently and strike the surfaces differently to bring out a different quality of sound. Um, and that's a great thing, right? Just imagine as a rock player, you had that range of touch available to you, even just playing rock, even if you never played right. jazz. Like, wow, that's going to, open up your rock drumming for a whole different range of feel and style and finesse and, you know, when you need it, when it's there. So another great yeah. reason to learn all these different yeah, stuff just because that's going to separate you from all of the other drummers. So yeah, it's right. not, it's like what you guys are saying is it's not that I'm going to be a jazz drummer or someone might not be interested in being a jazz drummer or playing in a Latin band, but you'll use all of those styles. Right. You can, you have those as tools in your toolbox. Right. And, and you draw upon them in the sometimes to me, it's always like this unexpected kind of place in a song where, whoa, it's a good thing I learned that Calypso thing or, right. or whatever. Right. Whatever it may be. Oh, yeah. Calypso. We'll yeah. get to that one too. Hey, uh, yeah. Chip, your <laughs> don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> I bet Rick's got clips up his sleeve, but we'll, we'll wait. We'll wait. It's just Rick. It's Chip's turn. Hey, what's happening, guys? It's, this has been a great show. I'm just enjoying watching this, man. I'm learning just already. There's all kinds of things to learn about this. One of the styles that comes to mind that, that I had to learn as a drummer <clears throat> to do gigs in the local scene with the blues bands and stuff was to be able to play a jazz ride with the feathered bass drum. Maybe one of you guys can demonstrate that to us. What's a feathered bass drum? So he's playing the bass drum, but he's not pounding it. Right. And that's a touch thing. So that was one of the styles that you need to know on the drums. You have to be able to do a jazz ride with a feathered bass drum to get through lots of songs. And I found that very useful for me. 
when you play with a feathered bass drum chip and i know a lot of times on a gig you can't switch stuff out but do you ever like maybe use depending on the gig would you use like a a soft a soft felt beater or maybe like a big you know mallet beater or something like that if i was going into a recording session i'd probably use a felt beater but usually during the gig i'm just using my regular beater the way it is okay okay just just, playing it lighter with that touch that jeremy was talking about yeah like right there when i was trying to play that i'm i'm playing heel down and just Mm -hmm. Just trying really hard to just touch yeah. the bass yeah, drum. Yeah, just get just, some of the know. tone out of the drum. Right. Yeah. And, I, and I also, what I think about when I'm trying to get tone out of the bass drum, thank you for saying that, Chip. This is the bass drum head. This is the beater. I'm not going bonk, bonk. You know, I'm going do, 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 And I'm trying to let the beater come out. I try to play beater out anyhow, but I try to let the beater come out of the head, you know, and that's kind of a slower tempo right there. So it's a little bit easier but I'm, a, I'm, I'm trying to let the beater come out of the head. If you listen, yeah. you can kind of hear the drum yeah. breathing right there. You know? Well, remember, too, in, in most jazz contexts, you're going to have a smaller bass drum that's tuned tighter. Mm-hmm. Um, that's more, much more resonant than your typical rock bass drum. And, so and this drum is tuned like a rock drum, but it's a 20, which is still kind of big for a jazz thing. You know, right. I mean, you might play an 18 or a right. 16, you know, right. even on a jazz thing. Right. But, um, so but, you yeah, know, summer, all day long, a great thing to practice is that feathering, getting the floor on the floor, and then just start comping the left hand. Yeah. One of exactly. my favorite books to work out of. Forever doing that. Right here, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The Art yeah. of Bop Drumming, John Riley. Matter of fact, I think I even, uh, yeah, yeah, you know. And, and this is not written with the kick drum in, but you can play it either way. Right, just kind of get that that the, the 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 jazz pattern happening. What and what I Rick, I don't know about you. I, I'll throw this to all three of you guys right there. When I'm playing that, and I'm thinking about feathering the kick drum, right? My focus for me is on the two and the four on the ride. Right. I'm really trying to de- dot it. I'm really trying to push forward with that. So it's and even though with the snare with the four on the floor and in both bars there in that two bar phrase, the snare drum was on one. I'm trying to make it not be so one oriented. Does that yeah did it translate? Well, Does that, that make sense? sense? I mean Yeah. I okay. I think Jeremy, I think a you lot would of know people have different different approaches on, on mm-hmm. these things. So uh-huh. um and well, I wanted to ask you, Jeremy, as well as Bart, the, the, first off, the ghosting, isn't that usually like a soft quarter note pulse that goes with a walking bass line? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Right. That's so right. You're, you're with that bass line, so you're, you're, your ghosting is on all four beats. All right. That's right. And then the ride, I've been working on trying to like emphasize the quarter note pulse and make the upbeat... So I'm, I'm working for a strong quarter note pulse and mm. then the one and ah, uh, you know, and the, and the four ah uh, are a little softer. So have you, you know guys, are, Jeremy, do you do that? Do you try no. to get, I mean, you know, yeah. so, so there's in a way you're, you're kind of both right. I mean, technically yeah. I, 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 I play a little bit closer to the way the, the Bart shades his, his ride symbol pattern, but yeah, the feeling of the four of the quarter note pulses is, is critical. And really you know, people get obsessed about the 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 the, the ride the jazz ride symbol pattern, ding ding to ding ding to ding, and that is what we teach, and that's what the basis of of learning to play swing is about. And then you learn all the left hand variations, then right foot, et cetera, et cetera. However, it's really all about the quarter note. Like you can yeah. 
you can swing your ass off with so ding 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 ding. We all know how Greg Bissonette talks, and in his lesson to me one time, I was in a lesson with him, and I'm working on this jazz thing. Hey man, come on, come on! You you're being way rock or man. Nothing swings better than a quarter note, man. He does a ding da ding da ding da ding da. Totally, 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 totally. So so it's easy, especially when you get start getting into you know into the left hand syncopation and stuff to sort of put the cart before the horse a little bit and get all about the syncopation and the left mm -hmm. hand gets too heavy and then you lose that that flowing feeling of the quarter note so you know it, a great exercise is you know think about even something like green onions which isn't a jazz tune per se but it's like swings its ass off right right um right. and that's just the quarter note based groove but you can you can play along with like freddie freeloader by miles davis or killer joe with the great benny golson tune and those are sort of groovy quarter note feeling jazz tunes that are great to start with just to get that feeling happening. And then let the skip be ding, ding, da, ding, kind of just drop in, you know. Uh, but I definitely don't try to emphasize the one and the three where I'm, I'm you know, da, ding, da, ding. I'm not doing that. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I meant by being like one oriented, right? Yeah. Well, it, I mean, what, one of the things about and you're, that snare pattern, that first – by the way, that John Riley book is is fantastic. Like that's absolutely a must a must have and a must go through book if you're interested in learning to play jazz. Right. Um, you know what what he what one of the things you'll notice if you start to look at the patterns in the first few pages there is that much of the phrasing is on the snare drum is oriented around upbeats. Right. Yeah, so yeah. it's like one, two, and three, and four, and and the three and four and right. Not to say yeah. there's no downbeats, yeah. but most of them sort of the phrases end on upbeats or they're mostly populated with upbeats. And that's because yeah, I'm looking at it right now. Yeah. And yeah. you're a hundred percent on, on comp example one, right. uh, page 18, they, they all, you know, like the second one and, Oh, I'm, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Jeremy, but I have to throw this in there. Um, the second one I'm going to play in just a second. I'm going to go back to what I was talking about a minute ago. Tone. If I was going to record this for a, a jazz gig or play a jazz gig also, we talked about the bass drum. I definitely wouldn't have this big old Mondo loud bell hand hammered <laughs> Sabian yeah. HH ride symbol up. Right. I would have, right. you know, a way more an artisan or something, something more buttery. Totally. I'm going to make a suggestion on that. The Sabian 21 inch groove ride. Dude, I got that these right here. Man. These are 15 inch <laughs> groove hats. And dude, these things are bud. You know, to use your hats your... and my ride symbol could get married, man. Dude. <laughs> yeah. They could, they, they could have little baby splash symbols. Um, <laughs> and it, it would just be amazing. So I get what you're That's saying, bro. <laughs> right. Exactly. You're yeah. sort of like a bull in a china shop there trying to be delicate on this. Exactly. It, because, dude, yeah. you know what? One of the yeah. things that I learned, and I got to mention his name. Uh, we just lost him. The great Ralph Humphrey. I, I feel that, yeah. you know, he was one of the greatest drum teachers I ever had, if not the best. Um, you know, he, uh, you know, he, t we were talking, the context was a, a snare drum thing that we were working on, but you know, he goes, you know, a snare drums, a loud instrument. So playing a snare drum quiet is, is hard to do. The, the volume's going to take care of itself, you know, so learn how to play, you know, kind of little quiet notes. Whereas, you know, this ride cymbal, dude, this is a loud ride cymbal, you know? Yeah. So even when I'm just touching it, right. Here's the upbeats. Here's comp example number two. One. Yeah. So, you know, and what there, incidentally, the what I did there first two times, I played it as it's written. Second time, I was not playing the feathered kick drum quarter note. So second two times through, I put on the second bar, I played the kick drum on the upbeat. So I played the two bar phrase between two different surfaces. So I, I'll work on that. And I run my students through that sort of stuff too. Um, Jeremy, a second ago, you said this is a go-to. And I think about uh, Alex cohen in new york he's been on the show twice and dude you watch alex play and that dude is a metal monster machine double bass guru and he says that you know every drummer has to go through this book you know and i i i think it's yeah anyway 
enough of me yakking. Um, <laughs> you know what? I wanted to um, circle back real quick to the Bossa Nova bar mm. that you played, and and I have a question for Jeremy. So if if we break down the Bossa Nova, we know Bossa Nova was Brazilian. It happened in the fifties. Antonio Carlos Jobim was the the main guy who kind of invented it. His his, if you want to hear great bossa novas, listen to the album he did with Frank Sinatra. Um, the girl from Ipanema. I love that version. It's on that. Yeah. That album has got to be the most sultry, like beautiful album. I mean, you could just, it's just like you're at the ocean when you listen to that. <laughs> so, so, well you know, said. we can't emphasize that it's just a delicate kind of groove, right? And it's got the boom, 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 boom. Boom, boom, which is, you know, the samba kick pattern, right? And that's pulled from the surdu drums, the big silver drums, right? That we're in samba, but it's more subtle. Then the cross stick, that's actually Brazilian clave, right? The three. Mm -hmm. the... One. Here's the two. Here's the one. One. There's the two. Bop, bop, bop. So there's a clave to that. So there's different claves, which are like the key, right? That I think to know a lot of these styles, you have to be familiar with what the clave is. And and our clave in, in the West is one, two, three, four. What it's just mm -hmm. fine. It's a way to look at it where where they have the the grouping of three notes and the grouping of two notes, and mm. you can flip it around. So um and Brazilian clave is different from the, the, you know, like the Cuban clave, you know, the song clave. So the Brazilian. So, Jeremy, but when you do the, the a bossa nova, are you playing in and out of that Brazilian yes. clave? Are you Great you question. that in your head, right? Yeah, that I, I think of. Uh, so all the Latin grooves, including the bossa nova, are more repetitive than when you're swinging and keeping time and comping, right? When you're playing jazz, straight ahead jazz, your left hand, you might play something different every single measure. Right. right. Yeah. Um, when you're playing these, these Latin grooves, you're pretty much more basing it on a thematic groove that is mm. repetitive, more like a rock thing in that way. Okay, um, right. Of course, they're also straight eighth note based mostly. Um, so, but I'm not, I'm not religiously adhering to like a specific pattern. I'm using that as the basis for the expression. So like, okay, yeah. you know, you just played the bossa nova, got to, to, got to, got to, to, got to, to, got to, to, with that clave pattern in the left hand. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm absolutely not sticking to that. Absolutely not. Right. You're not, you're not. No, yeah. I'm moving it around yeah. and I'm free okay. with it. Not, not crazy. Like there's sort of a, it's a taste thing. Like if you get too right. far afield and it goes, it's constantly changing. It's can be a little distracting, right? Right. Mm -hmm. it's called the clave for a reason, but um, but it's absolutely, you know, it's jazz. I mean, Brazil, bossa nova sort of, you know, and uh, Brazilian stuff was integrated into American jazz or whatever they synthesized together. And, right. you know, you, you hear jazz musicians playing this feel, right. well, they're going to do jazzy kinds of things with it. Right. It's right. not going to be like okay. strict adherence yeah. to a specific thing. Exactly. So you hear, you know, you can hear a bossa nova tune, and yeah, I, I, for example, I, I teach, you know, Bossa Nova, I teach it the way you guys do. There's that basic pattern. And then I also uh, have a couple of pages that I put together of snare drum and right hand variations. Oh, I um, want to get that from you. So I'm happy to send it. So yes, you know, yes, yes. But we usually, you know, they, my students, they learn the first basic groove and then I give them a tune to play along with a jazz tune a recording Blue Bossa or Siora or something like that. And they're playing it and like, well, wait a minute, the drummer's not playing the bossa nova i'm like he is playing a but he is playing the bossa nova but with like a you know lowercase b you know what i mean like it's not the, <laughs> it's not the exact pattern you've been doing the whole time through okay right? it's but it's based on that and it's it's interpretive and it's moving around a little bit and it's a little bit more free floating okay right. let me ask this jeremy because i i, I don't know I, um you know you've heard about when somebody's playing with in clave and I have a specific place where this has happened. So this, you get the clave backwards, you get the that, clave, clave cross. That, that's problematic. Okay. So if you're being free with the uh, bossa nova and it's the clave. Yeah. 
Okay, so so there you you will hear some jazz versions of bossa nova where the drummer uh -huh. will reverse it and play a two three instead of a three two clave. Okay, um, and and there can be a little bossa nova maybe not quite as important in a way with that, okay. but because there's nothing else that's keying off of that exactly, right? You've got ah. like a, the is doing kind of a, usually a, a one a one measure like a, a one bar pattern. Whereas with all the Latin stuff, like the Mambo and Afro-Cuban stuff, everything's happening in two bar phrases. So oh, if, okay. you start, if you flip around okay. the clave in the context of a Mambo, that's big trouble because then you're not lining up with where everything else is supposed to be lining up with the clave. Bossa Nova, not quite as, not quite as impactful if you mess it up like that. That, that makes sense. And, and the bossa nova has the steady kick anchor. So you're not really right. messing with that. Yeah, so. it's, it's almost like the left hand in the bossa nova is its own thing all by itself. There's nothing yeah, else okay. that's exactly tied to it in the same way that it is with the Latin, the other Afro-Cuban stuff. Yeah, that's my take. Um, makes sense. Uh, so, you know, I mean, you wouldn't I wouldn't want to be like. You, you, I mean, you can hear you will hear bossa novas where the drummer will switch it backwards, literally. But yeah. It's, uh, you know, that's, that, that can start to feel confusing. If you start with it one way and then you end up with it backwards, it starts, feels like what happened, the groove switched around. Right. So I, I wouldn't do that. Right. Um, I, I'll, I'll mess with it. I'll, I'll be a little free with it, but I'm not going to reverse it. I wanted hey, to share something really fun that I picked up from Zora. To, hold on, just a, and I don't mean to interrupt you, Rick. Let, Chip, jump in. You're trying to get something. I was, out. I was Sorry, hold Rick. that thought, Rick. Hold that Zoro thought. Uh, Ken McManus said he was Ken. going to ask what percentage of changing the different styles is equipment versus technique. I think it varies based on style, but are there certain pieces of equipment that you consider necessary to be a well-rounded, versatile drummer? Great question. Great question. Thanks, Ken. Great question. Yeah. Rick, go. Um, I, I would say um, a cowbell is definitely one of the main voices. You took you my kinda, answer. <laughs> and, and, and the great thing about a cowbell is, you know, you can rock out. You got to have a cowbell for rock. And then... And, and works in with, with like an Afro-Cuban 12-8 kind of thing. So... Um, Plus, there's nothing more fun than a cowbell. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I don't know if so I'd agree I, with that, but I don't know. Man. I, 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 I love a cowbell, but there's been I've had a, I've had some fun with other things. Yeah, yeah. right, 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 right. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying. I mean, so, just I'd, just I'd, saying. Like to, I'd like to answer that too. Um, you know, there comes a point if you're really serious about your playing and 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 playing at a professional level where you need to have the right drums for the right style of music. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and at a certain point, that's going to mean having two kits at a minimum. Yes. Um, yep. Right. You're going to yep. need to have a, if you're going to be playing jazz and bebop, you can't be playing it with a 22 inch bass drum. You just can't. Yep. Um, I mean, I, you know, I say that and I know, I know that the early bass drums were massive. They were like 26 and 28, all those crazy things. Right. But as the music evolved and drummers had to start carrying stuff around, the bass drums got smaller and that became the sound of jazz with that open sounding bass drum and not that dead thunky thing. That's a 22. Yep. Likewise, you can't play rock. You can't play Foo Fighters, Nirvana, Led Zeppelin, any of that stuff, even Johnny Cash with an 18 inch bass drum. Right. right? You, you need yep. to have some, something that feels like, you know, you feel it in your chest when it thunk hits, hits the head. So, you know, Ken's, you asked about different pieces of equipment and, and yeah, you know, we could get into accessories and, and there being some things you can get it, you can, you can get, but to me, the biggest thing is like having the right drum sounding drums for the right style, jazz versus rock and also the right cymbals. That's I want to, I, I want to second that. And yeah. I want to jump in here on a couple of things. If I mix, I have them yeah. at my disposal. Um, so and I'm going to go to the sky cam here and come back. Bart, can I just finish one more thought? Oh, I'm sorry, Jeremy. Yes, please. I'm sorry. My, right, my bad. Right. So, you know, I've got, uh, in addition to having different drum sets, I've got a whole range of cymbals. And depending on the gig, I'm going to go through my cymbals and put the right ones in the bag for the gig. 
Yep. And there are some that can do double duty, you know, some you know, blues and shuffle and groove stuff and jazz or whatever. There's some symbols that are versatile enough to do even rock and jazz, believe it or not. But um, I'm going to pick the symbols for the gig. And I think for me, that's a big part of like, uh, this is the sound I'm going to want to be able to produce on this type of music is with this sonic palette, if you will, yeah. of, of drums and cymbals. Yeah. And to me, that's a big part of, of making the music sound the way it's supposed to sound. Yeah. Totally, totally. I I mentioned a minute ago the ride symbol that I have up here. Um, I've got various ride symbols. The one that I've been touring with lately has been the Sabian uh, Paragon, the Neil Peart ride, because it works great with the band that I'm with. It's got a big bell and it's a little more honky sounding, if that is a adjective that describes it, than this, which is a very sharp bell. Um, in this particular case, uh, the set that I'm sitting at, uh, I'm in my teaching studio and my recording studio right now. I just did a song that required a China boy, so I got a little 12-inch China here. Sometimes I got a splash that sits on there. Again, this is, you know, a stylistic thing, but it's also a sonic thing we're talking about. Uh, we were joking about the hi hats. These are 15 inch groove hats by Sabian. So I'm I'm really just echoing what Jeremy said. One of the things that I can take this drum set and I can play it. And I'll, matter of fact, I'll give an example right now. So I have two different snare drums uh, uh, in here at my disposal right now. Both of them are Gretsch. Right here at the beginning of the show, I talked about doing a session earlier in the week where I needed a real tight snare drum. And so I put this drum up and it's tuned really tight. It, it recorded when I recorded it, it didn't sound as tight as uh, I wanted it to. Uh, it worked out, but I thought it was going to be judging by what it sounds like right here. I thought it was going to be a lot more pop, you know, like a pop sound than, than it ended up being. And then I also have, uh, this is one of my favorite, the guys played this drum uh, at the, uh, at the, deck days this is my gretch free floater it's maple brass maple this is much more of a rock kind of a thuddy and way uh more um you know loose snare drum head and my point is this i'm yakking a lot i apologize you can change just the snare drum just the snare drum nothing else and the whole dynamic and the sound of the kit changes, right? So yeah. we haven't really talked about rock a whole lot today, and that's kind of what I do. But with this real tight snare drum, if I play... One of my favorite halftime shuffles, Fool in the Rain, uh, and then I just change the snare drum, okay? First of all, it's a deeper drum, so going to get a little bit more of a honk sound out of it i don't have it tuned nearly as tight i'm going to go ahead and put my ring on there that was sitting on the other drum to kind of deaden it a little bit okay so i play the same groove using two different snare drums uh and I think that that is a good demonstration of just changing the snare drum can yeah. change the whole feel of the kit and the whole sound of the kit. So like Jeremy was saying, if I was going to play a pop gig, I probably wouldn't take the last snare drum. That wouldn't be my choice. I would probably take this drum tuned up really high. We're going to have Aquarian on next week, but this has got the modern vintage on it and it is tuned tight. Probably take mm -hmm. that drum with me. You know, but Ken's, out. you know, you're that's that's great part. Really great demonstration that and those yeah. snares sound totally different and they really do change the vibe of the groove, right? But yeah. I, I want to circle back to the other half of Ken's question, which is what percentage of changing to different styles is technique as oh. opposed to equipment? Yeah. Um, and that that's a really big one. You know, I've heard really uh I remember hearing Victor Lewis, who's a really amazing top jazz drummer, play a beat up old junky piece of crap drum set and just sound amazing on it. So, yeah. you know, it, the drums and the cymbals matter. They help you get to produce the sounds you're looking for. And, you know, I'm a big proponent of that and believer in that. But, you know, you can sound, you can play, you can have a, a jazz ride cymbal and a jazz bass drum and playing on a jazz gig and you can sound terrible. You know, yeah. you can play with too heavy a hand. Yeah. You can yeah. play, 
you can have the right rock drum set, but if you play too wimpy or without any kind of authority or conviction, you know, you're not going to deliver. So, you know, the drums and cymbals help, but they don't do it for you, right? The, te the technique, right. it's the drum, <laughs> right? Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. So, so while those things help you, you know, whatever, dial in your expression, you know, uh, you have to learn the technique required to play different styles to sound different, right? The, right. The, one yeah. of the best, I, I think that uh, I have a lot of my students, the beginning students who like, they kind of, I can tell who they are with my eyes closed. If they sit down at the drum set. Yeah. Because they play the drums a certain way and they're kind of one dimensional and they're, they're not used to playing with any kind of range of touch. Mm. Right. And then, but I, I, I kind of think it's good to, you know, not, there's nothing wrong with that exactly, but I mean, I think it's really good to be like a chameleon as a drummer, yeah. both in terms of the styles you can cover and in terms yeah. of the way you can deliver them, you know, can you, can you be like Steve Gadd, right? Just play everything just sounding perfect all the time, no matter what the style. Yeah. Right. Well, well in the I range think. of touch, I mean, I, uh, my question is I, I, I'm hitting them as hard as I can. So, so what's the problem? <laughs> what's the problem? Like I can't hit them any harder. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you guys, I, I ran into, uh, I don't know if you guys know who Kevin Army is. Uh, he was the producer of Dookie, the Green Day, first Green Day album. And uh, yeah. he, was, he was a producer who worked with Green Day. And he was telling me the story about when they were recording that album, how he was telling Trey Cool to hit the, he wanted him to hit the drums as hard as he possibly could. Yeah. You know, don't worry about it being too loud. We can dial it in the mix. But I want that sound of that really aggressive, big, fat drum sound. Mm -hmm. And that was what he needed to make that power pop thing happen. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's perfectly right in the right situation and perfectly wrong in the wrong situation. So that's right. right. That's right. That's I, right. I, I, I want to take this time to jump in here. I've been on on this subject and that is you know, Jeremy, we've all said, you know, we start students with rock and roll. We do this rock and roll simple and this and that. And I agree. Rock and roll is way, it's going to be way simpler to play a lot of rock tunes than it is going to be to play the girl from Ipanema from, you know, the Frank Sinatra record that you mentioned, Rick, it just yeah. is. Okay. However, that being said, um, having gone through numerous recording sessions with a, a couple producers that were really sticklers about time just being able to play a four on the floor like you mean it like you were just saying about trey cool and nice. sell it and not flam on the two and four or flam on any notes making sure those notes are simultaneous play it right with the click track not rushing any fills and keep that time absolutely as close to the click as you can possibly get it. Yeah. Anybody that says that rock and roll is easy, that's not easy to do. It just no, isn't it, right. It no. isn't, you no. know, I've been, I, I, I wish I would have written down on a calendar the days that I heard the, the first time I heard back in black because it really did change my life and the way that, because I mean, I would celebrate it as a religious holiday. That's why I wish I'd have written it down. I, <laughs> I love that groove. And to this day, every time I hear that, you know, you hear that, you hear that hi hat going, hear the guitar, you know, Oh my God, back in black is just huge. And you know, the, playing that song and really selling that song is not as easy as it sounds. Same thing, you know, Aerosmith walked this way. Um, and then from there you go into uh, immigrant son with Led Zeppelin. Those songs are not easy to play and play them with time and conviction. So rock and roll is something that, you know, holding that time, holding that pulse is 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 something that you need to be able to do and then also within rock and roll okay i played a i played a halftime shuffle when i played fool in the rain a lot of rock music a lot of metal music swings so if you're into metal but you don't know how to swing hey man 
You're Fairies wear boots. That's a jazz tune, right? I mean, know how to play that stuff. Be aware of that stuff. Right. Anyway. anyway. Right. You know, Bart, you're so accurate. You know, I, I look at my brother-in-law, Gene Hoagland, who, you know, one of the top extreme metal drummers, if not the top in the world. And, you know, he listens to the Soul Station on Sirius XM when we're driving. He listens to R&B and Soul. And Stevie Wonder is his favorite drummer, you know? And really? You, and you hear that's what it is. Like, while, while, while all these other metal drummers are just working on pure speed, they've got this pure machine-like 16th note thing. It doesn't groove. And you listen to Gene, even though he's doing, like, really fast stuff and, and, and a lot of 16th notes, it all has its subtle swing to it. And I think that's the importance. And we, we could do, we could do ep, a episode just on that. I just yeah. right. swing feels and variations of it. So, and, and you know, if important you important for all drumming, it's not just that we're trying to turn people into jazz heads or, or Latin. Oh heads. no. And I did, I didn't mean it that way. No, not at all. I mean, I mean, heck one of my favorite drummers yeah. in the world. And I think we'd all agree with, with this is, you know, Alex Van Halen. My God, Alex Van Halen. Right. Hopper dude, look, look at the shuffle. Dude, of right. Keaton, right. Center swing. I mean, dude, all yeah. that stuff just, Oh, it's, it's crazy. And yeah. I have some bottom charts and I don't know where they are right now. I got some bottom charts around here and on the chart, right. It says, slightly swung you know so now you're in the you're in no man's land you know are we playing blues we playing rock playing jazz what are we playing here and how do you create that feel groove time and feel three most important things to drumming so i guess the for kens to answer the question and i mean i don't know if this is even still something that's on the table but to kind of circle back around to what he had asked i think stylistically you have to be well versed. I think technically you have to be well versed. And I also think, again, to what we've kind of said here today, the gear, you know, have the right gear for the gig. And I couldn't agree with you more, Jeremy, that, yeah, you're going to have to have two or three kits. You know, I've got a lot of drum sets, you know, I mean, I just put that picture up of that, the, um, I'm a Gretsch guy. I've been with Gretsch forever, but I got that bottom kit. I got that, that big, Vista light orange kit. I'm not, you know, if I got called to play a jazz gig, I'm not going to take that kit with me, <laughs> you know? So I think it's, I think it's all encompassing. I think it's a little bit of everything. Yeah. Hey, let me give you the quick little Zorro thing. Okay. We're working, on Zorro side thing, stick. Right? We're working on cross stick. And this is just a fun little, little riff for people to mess with. And this is what Zorro would do. Can you hear my fingers? Yeah. yeah. Could you hear that little crack, crack nice. with your finger? That's cool, yeah. It's such a cool thing. It's just such a subtle texture. So you could hit a hat and then and then grab the cross stick. So that was a cool thing that Zoro's nice. Zoro showed That's me and cool. I love doing that. That's yeah. cool. And That's you think cool. it's not gonna be mic'd up, but it's one of those things. It you feel it. You know, you may, it may not be very audible in a big, you know, room, but in a smaller room or on a recording, it's something that could add a little, little spice to, to your groove. And, and to bring that into the area of, of a, of a technique thing or, or a rudimental thing. We haven't talked about the rudiments today. Yesterday, uh, I gave an online lesson. Uh, I was out of town on a little vacation, but I had a student, I had to get a lesson in, so I gave him lesson uh on a practice pad while i was in in my hotel or in my cool. my the condo and we were talking about drags right so just getting that that the drag or the rough you know getting that you know it is she she was going i can't really hear it on the pad and i'm like okay but it Maybe you won't hear it a lot, but it is there. It is audible. Yeah, just the same there. thing as what you're saying. You know, just right. that same same type of thing. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Hey, real quick before we sign off, because we're yeah. we've done our hour. Yes. What's your favorite? Everybody, just give me your a favorite groove, like style. Oh uh, boy, I, I New Orleans second line probably my favorite stuff to play. 
Yeah, you're a master at it. We've got to do another show on this, Jeremy, with you on drums. Yeah, yeah. I, next time. Hey, by the way, before you guys answer that, I'm I'm putting a list in the comments, just dumping a whole bunch of styles that I think are important to know. And guys, please add to the list. I, it's just off the top of my head, so I know I'm missing a bunch. So check that out. And oh, this goes cool. for not just the drummers here, but the, you guys listening, like add styles to the list. Oh, that's cool. You Chip, what's, right what about cool. you? What do you love What's to play? That? What are your favorites? What are my favorites? Yeah. Mom, well, my favorites are the, the Two Princes groove. I like that one. <laughs> oh, Damn it. No. I knew he was going to say it. No, I'm not, like, no, not going to play it. Nope. I like the funky drummer from Clyde Stubblefield. Yeah. I like that yeah. groove. That's a yeah. groove I can play all day long. Oh, man. What about Chip, you, Rick? There, What are your favorites? You know, I, I've been, it's, it goes in waves right now. I'm kind of into Mozambique drumming, you know, yeah. oh, yeah. Yeah. Influence, you know, what Steve Gadd played on, oh. on late in the evening, you know, cool. okay. it's got that African, African bell. Let's see. I'm missing up. I'm going to play it real quick. That sounds like late in the evening. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know what? Good call. Yeah. Oh, that's tough. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, thanks. For on. Oh, sorry. One more. Yeah, Bart. Walk this way. Walk this way. I'm a rock pig on pizza, okay? I go. love rock and roll. My heart beats on two and four, okay? There it just does. Like and, I, and I love the stuff. And, and I, to me, give me a good, I mean, I love, uh, you know, late in the, all these songs, I love them. I, 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 I love the drummers that we've talked about today and the different styles and the feels and everything like that. But man, I tell you what, give me a backbeat and just, just let's rock any yeah. day of the week, man. It, it doesn't matter if it drives, if it swings, if it, whatever, if it makes me want to drive really fast, I'm in, yeah. you know, anything that's fast and loud, I'm on it. I love nice. it. I love it. So I'm a, I, and Hey, I try to play other styles, but rock and roll. That is, I live there. There it is. Yeah. All right. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Great stuff. You guys, as always, we'll see you next week with our uh, Aquarian drum head special. We'll be giving away a bunch of free drum heads. So please be sure to tune in. We'll be here with Chris Brady and Mike Bruker. And they're going to talk all about the different offerings at Aquarian and talk about drum heads in general. Can't wait to have those guys on. Thank you guys for tuning in. And we'll Thank see you. Thank Thanks you. So Are you oh. playing us out? Are you playing us out, Rick? I'll 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 uh, Mozambique it out. <laughs>